this thing. Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, Copernic Friday Night Live Stream. My name is Drew Desker, director here uh, at Copernic, and uh, glad to have you join us uh, this evening. Or if you're watching it afterwards, uh, glad uh, that you were able to uh, check into our YouTube channel and um, and learn about the summer skies at your convenience. Um, tonight's uh, presenter is uh, Copernic educator Roy Williams, uh, who'll be giving us a tour of the night sky. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the other things we we're doing up here at Copernic. Um, but uh, again, as always, uh, if you're in a position to sort of help us out, look just below in the uh, description area. There's a, an opportunity for you to uh, offer a donation to uh, sort of help underwrite what we do here. So I'm going to just pan the camera right over to Roy, let him say a quick hi, and we'll get started. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, on the Internet there. Southern uh, Summer skies. So I'm going to give you a little preview of the night sky, how to observe things. And we got a little special comet that's also out in the sky as well. So we want everyone to like, share, and subscribe. And let's get forward here. Let's move on here to what we got here. So, uh, yeah, summer sky. So we're going to talk about the bright stars, constellations, uh, the planets, and, and more. What kind of things you can see in the night sky during the summertime. All right. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope. One of the things we promised during our programs is to show you some of the latest images of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we have the Butterfly Nebula here, uh, NGC 6302 and NGC 7027, also known as the Gummy Bear Nebula, but it's too far away to eat. But anyway, uh, these are incredible objects to look through through a telescope. And what they are, they're called planetary nebulas. But that's kind of a misnomer. In the 1800s, they were named uh, because they kind of look like planets through those telescopes. Uh, basically, what they are are stars that have died. They've uh, kind of puffed away their outer layers of their atmospheres, and they're leaving. They left a, a white dwarf star in the center of them. So some of them are kind of round, like the Gummy Bear Nebula, but many of them have different shapes. Uh, they're always fun to watch through our telescopes here at the observatory. So the other thing we like to do in the summertime is to see when the International Space Station and other satellites fly over. Uh, the space station is really bright when it goes directly overhead. You go to a website called heavensabove.com. Make sure you put the little hyphen in between. Otherwise, you go, end up going to an insurance company. So, uh, But anyway, it's, it's a great website. We've been using it actually since the late 90s when it had a different name. But uh, basically... You know, you log on, you're going to put your location in there. You can actually have a little map feature where you can actually, um, you know, put your look, uh, click on your location and you're all set. You don't have to be super accurate. I've noticed it with my sister up in Rochester. You know, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, and they give you a map of where the satellite is going to be visible and when it's going to be visible. So we'll show you what the website looks like here, uh, heavens above. So when you go on, when you go to the website, uh, like I mentioned, you will have to enter in your location the first time you do it. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's a little tricky sometimes, sometimes latitude and longitude. If you do the latitude and longitude method, make sure you put negative uh, number for longitude. Otherwise, you end up in, in, uh, near India in Tibet. So you don't want to do that. But anyway, so what heavens above looks like... Um, are you good? There, there we go. Come on. So it's a very friendly way of, of finding things. There's a lot on this website. There's a lot of things. Uh, it shows you the height of the space station. It shows you all different types of things. Um, we could probably do a whole program on this website alone. But anyway, give you an idea of what it, what it looks like. There we go. So do we have it? Yeah, we do. Okay. We want to it. Okay. A little technical issue here. We'll get it. There we go. All right. So in, it shows where, when the, where the space station is at present time over the Earth. And uh, again, on the left-hand side here, you can see all different types of satellites. So what you do is you go to 10-day predictions for satellites. ISS is one we're going to look at here. So you can press down. They give you a table first. And then you can look at your date. The brightness is how bright it is. And that's the negative. more negative the number is, the brighter it is. And so... And then the middle of the chart kind of shows you how high it's going to get. The start will show you which direction to look. And that's really important. What you want to do is get a few friends around. And uh, you know, the more eyeballs you have watching, 
more likely you're going to see it in the very beginning. But uh, if we scroll down there, there's one that, uh, here's a good one at 86 degrees there on Ju July 13th, up higher. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can pick your, which you want to look at. Uh, it shows you what time you're going to see it. Now, it's military time, so at 2249, you probably wouldn't see it right there because that's true horizon. Maybe by 2251, you'd see it somewhere in Virgo. And it's going to make its way. It has an arrow showing which direction it's gone. And that one went straight overhead. This one's going straight overhead, so that's going to be a great one. The higher it goes, typically the brighter it is. So it's very easy to use this chart. Typically, what I'd be looking for on this one, I'd find the bright store in Buades called Arcturus. We're going to put our cursor over there. There we go, Arcturus. And that's what I would kind of look for and just kind of look over to the side of that and wait for something to move and uh, follow it. It's, it's fantastic, OK? So check it out sometime. Again, it's heavens, heavens above. Dot com. There's a, another thing uh, out there that SpaceX is doing is that they're launching uh, 60 satellites at a time to create something called Starlink. Starlink will eventually be a network of 40,000 miniature satellites that's going to provide internet all around the world. And I think we have a little representation. You can go there and see a little representation. There they are. They're floating around. More space junk. Okay. So anyway, uh, it's going to be very exciting. When they do launch, they use, um, they, they get, uh, they kind of form a straight line and they have these ion engines that kind of glow and they're brighter at that point and they move out on a straight line, but eventually they start scattering around and go to their set orbits. So anyway, that's another thing you can also do with Heavens Above. So uh, moving on now to, um, to what causes seasons. Uh, so why is the summer, why is the summertime? So good to, to, uh, to observe. Uh, first, let's figure out what causes the seasons. Now, what causes the seasons is a combination of the Earth going around the sun and our axis is tilted. Tilt to, it's tilted to the North Star is the way I visualize it. So looking at this diagram, you can see that the North Star, that the axis is pointing in one direction and above that is, is the North Star. And it always is tilted toward the North Star and as we go around, we're going to get a different angle that the sun appears in the sky. So that's going to cause different lengths of days. So in the wintertime, we're going to have uh, very short days, all right? And then in the summertime, we're going to have very long days and unfortunately short nights. But th so that's basically what causes that. To give you an idea, to graph this out uh, in a graph, what we have here is on the uh, y-axis, we have the hours and length of of the day and then down below we have the month so in the middle of the chart is June solstice there and for our area uh, we're at 42 degrees so we didn't quite have anything close to 40 I was looking for a chart that would have 40 degrees but if you look at the 50 so we're we're below we're about 14 and a half hours is the longest day for us uh, so that provides a, a very short night of about eight and a half hours or so of nighttime and again it's not totally dark because the sun, we still got twilight on both ends of the, of the nighttime. We've got twilight when the sun goes down and as the sun comes up. So the nighttime, the real obs astronomical observing time in the summer uh, does suffer because of that. So it's a very short window, so to speak. But this is a great graph showing that. Um, so if we didn't have any tilt at all and we were just straight up and down, we would have 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime uh, everywhere on the Earth. So. Uh, which would be kind of boring. We'd probably have uh, climate zones instead of, so it'd be summer all the time at the equator. Where we are, it'd be fall all the time probably. So that'd be, that'd be kind of neat. I like the fall, but okay. To give you an idea what the sun does as um, the season, the different seasons, wintertime, very short arcing path. For us in Broome County, it, the sun only gets about 23 and a half degrees at its highest point um, on, on the winter solstice. During the equinox and autumn and spring, <clears throat> it's in the middle there. And in summer, again, about 73 and a half degrees is the highest it gets in the sky. It's a myth that it gets straight up in the sky at noon. Uh, that only happens uh, near the equator. Uh, but anyway, that's that's kind of gives you an idea of, of the path of the sun on the on the different seasons. Now, summer sky conditions in general. What what's going on? Well. Obviously, shorter nights, so you don't have as much time to observe. You have to really plan your observing session well because it, it goes quickly. 
Uh, it's, the advantage over winter is that it's warmer, so you don't have to bundle up as much. In many times we observe in shorts, okay? Uh, it is higher humidity typically in our area than it is in the winter where, when it's drier. Uh, there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, <clears throat> typically the higher humidity makes the air steady, uh, what we call seeing, which makes it better for planets. What we call seeing is how steady the atmosphere, the twinkling of the stars. Um, as the light passes through the, our atmosphere, it's bending and reflecting based upon um, our atmosphere. And typically, uh, it's, the stars don't twinkle as much and the planets are better to observe in, in the summertime. Uh, not always, but uh, typically that's, that's one thing, an advantage. Uh, some of the brighter stars that are out there, we have Altair, Deneb, and Vega. These are beautiful gems out there in the night sky. And if you don't even know your stars, you could look out. And if you looked at the three brightest stars, you'd probably pick out these three. You might not know which ones they are. But they form something called the summer triangle, all right? So once it gets dark, about, about this time of year, about 45 minutes after the sun goes down, an hour after the sun goes down, you can start seeing at least two of these three stars popping up. It's actually kind of more out in the fall, which is kind of funny, but they call it the summer triangle. And what they did was that uh, they, they we, we call it an asterism. It isn't really a constellation. It's a um, kind of a made up parts of different, constellations. They stole a star from each constellation. So you got Deneb from Cygnus and, and Altair from Aquila. All right. And, and so basically you, you make a triangle out of those three stars. Um, and let me see. What's the other one? Uh, Vega. Vega out of Lyra. All right. So anyway, those three stars make up the summer. And it's huge. It's so big you might miss it. So planetary roundup. What's going on with the planets this time of year for this year? Uh, now, the planets change every year because they're moving around and we're moving around in our orbit, so it isn't always like this every summer. But right now, Saturn and Jupiter are the main things, um, the main planets that are out in the early evening. They're starting to come out now. Um, it's changed quite a bit. I was just up here about a month ago, and it seemed like it wasn't until 11 o'clock they were coming up. So I saw them last night, I think at 9 or so. So they're out pretty early now. Um, and then later in the morning, you have Venus and Mars. Uh, Venus is in right smack dab in the middle of Taurus the Bull there, uh, looking east at 4.30 in the morning. But that's basically the planetary round, uh, roundup there. Uh, so in the early evening, again, we have Jupiter and Saturn kind of in the, in the eastern, southeastern sky. Um, now here's what they kind of look like through our telescopes. This picture was taken through one of our, our six-inch telescope, I believe. And, and also Jupiter a few years ago um, that we got to see. Um, oh, okay. Oh, Scorpio. Yeah. So what was this? 2007. All right. So one of the main constellations, one of the things you can do is that you can take a, you can use a camera, a DSLR camera, and take a wide angle shot, put it on a tripod, take a 30 second picture, and then with your computer you can find the constellations and draw these lines in. So it's one of the things we do in some of our, our classes up here. And uh, there's uh, Scorpio with the bright star Antares, which is a reddish looking star, means rival of Mars. Right. And one of the, later on in the evening, it's not really a summer constellation, but because we have comet Neowise, this, this uh, constellation is going to play a little role in spotting comet Neowise, which is out, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But Auriga is a bright star. Capella, uh, you can't miss it. Very bright star. All right. Again, this one, this, this one comes up a little bit later on. All right. So that kind of gives you the rundown of some of the constellations. At, toward the end of the program, I'll, I'll show you more constellations with the Stellarium program. But now, to get you ready for this big comet that's out in the sky, uh, Comet hale -Bopp, which was a fantastic comet we saw in 1997, and it was out for several months. We believe Comet Neowise might get as bright as, as, uh, as hale -Bopp, but it probably won't be a, a, around as long as hale -Bopp was. But, uh, you know, so you might be asking, what is a comet? Well, comets are, um, you know, they stay out in the sky for a while. They can stay out for several weeks or several months. They are large, basically dirty snowballs of ice in space. And so I thought we would, we would make a, a comet here and... Um, so what kind of ice are we talking about? Well, we're talking
talking about uh, mostly dry ice, what we call carbon dioxide ice. And this ice is very, very cold. It's, uh, let's get a little spoonful of it. It's about 110 degrees below zero. And you can see why they call it dry ice, right? When you, when you blow on it, it goes right from a solid into a gas. So it skips the liquid phase. So, uh, so yeah, so it's totally dry. Um, all right, now, that's not the only type of ice we have. We also have, and we're going to get a close-up here. Our technician is getting just, us a... Just like a, on the cooking shows. A, yeah, there we go. Except I don't have one already made. Okay, so this better work. So uh, we got water ice, too. So imagine regular temp uh, room temperature water going on that really cold, dry ice is going to freeze. A um, little bit of ammonia there. We don't have today, but we pretend we put some a little bit of ammonia in there. And some rocky material. Comets also have rocky material in there as well. And we're going to show you a picture of, of the comet, of Halley's Comet's nucleus. Let me get my gloves on because I don't want to get frostbite. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cold. Uh, I'm going to change it completely All right. to the... Uh, i got to get my gloves yeah. on here. Webcam, yeah. Okay. Much better. Okay, here we go. All right. Yeah, I'm going to need a little, little more water ice in there. I need a little bit more water. Here we go. All right. Yeah. One way to cool off. Don't, don't try <laughs> I, this at home. Right, I just felt that on my legs. It felt great. It was so hot and humid today. Ooh, here we go. And this is, so what we made is not the whole comet. This is the, what we call the nucleus of the comet. And the nucleus of the comet is just right here. So the, this is what we just made. And most of the time, comets are really far away from the sun. So there's no tail. It's, it's not too, so much different than like an asteroid would look like through a telescope. But as it gets close to the sun, it begins to heat up and form a tail. All right. So anyway, that's... Uh, typically, they're you know a few miles across. Uh, Comet Neowise is three miles across. Halebach was a huge, a very large nucleus. It was it was 40 miles across to give you an idea. So it was a very large comet. Um, anyway, that's basically what a comet is. You can get di different types of tails. The the dust tail there you see on on Halebach is you, if you notice the stuff is falling, dust is falling off of this. That's leaving, that, that dust is going to follow in orbit around, and that's reflecting sunlight. So we call that the dust tail. And then the gas that's glowing due to the sun's energy, we call that the ion tail. Now, a lot of times these two tails are on top of each other, so it just looks like one tail. And I think that's what we got for Neowise. So anyway, if we, let's go to the next. Actually, let me yep, say here, actually, we have a question uh, on the sure. chat. So actually, uh, All right. so anybody who's out there, if you uh, have a question for Roy, please uh, enter it into the chat box. It is about a 20 or 30 second delay, but uh, uh, anyway, let's see here. Yeah, there we go. What was the question? So the question is, do comets form or do they break off of larger bodies? Yeah, uh, no, not so much breaking off larger bodies. What we, They do break up, though. Uh, but it's not like there's a comet planet out there. Uh, basically what it is is that comets are the pristine leftover stuff from where the universe, uh, not universe, solar system formed, and most of them are outside of what you would call the, the solar system, the, you know, past Pluto in something called the Kuiper Belt and beyond something called the Oort Cloud where they come from. So basically there's this uh, donut or, you know, sphere of material kind of surrounding the solar system of this icy, uh, pristine, original stuff that the solar system formed out of. Um, and um, so it, we're always interested in getting, uh, there was a spacecraft flyby and, and actually was able to capture some dust from a comet, and that stuff's very important to study. All right, so now to show you, if you notice that there's some lighter areas and darker areas of, of, of the comet, and now we're gonna switch to, let me show you a picture of of uh, Halley's Comet taken through a spacecraft that flew by Halley's Comet, and that's right. Oh, no, no, it's not. It's not there advancing. Go. Yeah. There it is. Go ahead now. Now it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got to we got to advance it forward. Next slide, please. There we go. 
Okay. So, uh, comment Hallie. Um, there we go. So you can see uh, you can see the lighter areas where the jets of material is coming off, and the darker, more rocky area of the nucleus itself. Uh, this is the Jato spacecraft from the European Space Agency that took that in 1986. Um, all right. Well, yeah. Earlier, you talked about the Kuiper Belt, and another question uh, from Dale is: Have we sent any spacecraft into the Kuiper Belt? Yes, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft has uh, gone into the Kuiper Belt. It saw Pluto, and it's investigating other bodies beyond Pluto. Had a close approach of, of uh, I'm forgetting its name. They've renamed it recently. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Ultima Thule is what it was originally called, but they changed its name. So um, anyway, they did see it was like a two planetesimals put together. It was a very strange, almost like a pancake-type object. So they're finding all types of really neat stuff out there. And it's, it's really uh, a type of thing where they're spotting some of these objects and trying to veer the spacecraft in such a way to rendezvous with some of this stuff. So, uh, it's, so and to some degree, it's winging it. Now, uh, what happens with comets is that this material falls off, and eventually the Earth runs into some of this material, and we get meteor showers from that. So coming up, we have the Perseid meteor shower. It peaks on the night of the 11th each year. Every year on August 11th, the Earth runs into this uh, debris field left by a comet, and you get to see these meteors. And what they are is this tiny grains of dust from the comet going through our atmosphere at 20 miles per second or so and burning up, ionizing the atmosphere as it comes down and, and glowing. So, you know, as far as if we're going to be open or not, we're still looking into that. Uh, we're looking into how to manage it and make it safe. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that if you're interested in viewing the meteor shower. But again, you can go to any field that's away from city lights uh, to watch the meteor shower. Just get a blanket and, and kick back and watch it. So it's a lot of fun. All right. Any questions? Are we doing good on? Good night. Okay. That's actually, uh, so now, let's, the part of the program we got one? There, not so much a question as, a, as, a, as an observation is mm -hmm. that, uh, uh -oh. said that I heard that Mark Twain wrote in on Haley's comment yes. and left on the next pass. Right. That's right, yeah, and I'm going to go out when Hale Bob comes back 4,000 years from now. Okay. So yeah, 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 that's true. That's a true story. Mark Twain was, a, was an amazing person. So Comet Neowise, uh, this is a picture. Hopefully, hopefully this comes out over the Internet. This George Normandin, our president of our Astro Society, uh, took this picture a couple mornings ago, and it is naked eye at this point. I think at this point it was just barely naked eye, but yesterday morning, or is it this morning? This morning. this morning, okay. This morning, Jeremy Cardi, another educator here, took this uh, just down the road here, and it's getting much brighter. So it's quite possible it could rival Comet Hale Bob. Uh, he predicted it right at this. Uh, his estimate was at zero magnitude. So that's a pretty bright comet, um, and so it had a nice tail on it. And uh, so, how can you spot this comet? You might be asking. Well, there is a finder chart here. Um, that you can have a look at. It, it tells you that the dates that, that on each one of these numbers is July. So we are at July 11th. We're over here in Auriga, and we're going to make our way uh, to the 12th, the 13th. And, yeah, so each, each day it should be getting brighter and brighter until it gets to July 22nd when it's going to be closest to the Earth. So although it's closest to the Earth, it's also getting further away from the sun. So there might be some happy medium uh, on, you know, comets are unpredictable because, you know, they can brighten up for other reasons. So really, any night that it's clear over the next couple weeks, I would get out there and see it. Right now, it was in the morning, although now I believe it's switching over. Uh, after today, it's going to start becoming an evening object, I believe. So uh, it's kind of in, it's right near the sun, so it's kind of hard to spot. But... Over the next few days, going toward the 22nd, it's going to be something to really check out. Okay, and it'll be in the evening, uh, which makes it a lot easier than getting up at 4:30 in the morning. Okay, so um, all right, just kind of give you a summary here. What we got? It was discovered by the Neowise Telescope, which is, stands for Near Earth Objects Something, and this is a telescope that's looking for near Earth objects that might even hit us, and it's actually in orbit around the Earth. And it was discovered only in March 27th, so this is a brand new comet. Um, it apparently has just under 7,000-year orbit, so even longer than Hale-Bopp. 
Uh, close approach to the sun, which we call perihelion, was July 3rd. And it actually went in just inside the, the orbit of, of Mercury. All right. And the nucleus is about three miles across, five kilometers in diameter. Again, much, much smaller than, um, than Comet Hale-Bopp. Visible in the evening sky just after sunset now. So, uh, yeah, so right now in the next few weeks will be more in the evening sky. And the Big Dipper is going to play a big role in this. So I'll kind of show you when we do Stellarium in just a minute. I'll show you where to look along that. That, that chart I had is from Sky and Telescope magazine. So our skyandtelescope.com. So you can search for it that way. Um, and close approach to the Earth is July 22nd. Again, that's my gut feeling. I believe it's going to be about 30 degrees above in the horizon. So that's pretty good. So once the sun goes down, you want to start looking in, uh, for the comet near the Big Dipper. Uh, okay, so here we go. Let's see. What else we got? I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So let's go to Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium is a program that you can get for free on the internet. You go to stellarium.org and it's a great program. You download it and you can have it on your machine and it basically shows you the night sky program, shows you all the constellations. It shows you where the planets are. You can see where the deep sky objects are as well. And uh, there we go. So, so what we have here is uh, Stellarium here. What time are we at? And there's all types of features. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Got some. All right. So let me just get acclimated where I am here. All right. So there's a little feature here with a clock. So here we are at four in the morning, um, no, July fifteenth, and I'm going to hit stop. Mm -hmm. So anyway, let me go back. And where's my, uh, Actually, there it is. I'm going to get rid of the, it has these uh, drawings on it. I'm going to get rid of those for a second here. Um, and there we go. And how do I pause it? So I just hit a little bit. Good. Uh, and yeah, because that's going to, okay. All right, so. So what we have here is um, this. Uh, it's still, yeah, it's still running though. We're gonna try to stop it. There's some reason. It's it just hit. Is that something to do with your? Yeah, if we go into here we are. There right we now. go. Okay. All right. So real. Oh, so went to defaulted to present time. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we got. Um, so we got uh, July 10th, and um, so July 10th, and we're approaching 8 o'clock. And so let's um, get the clock out of the way so you can see what's going on. You can use the mouse of your, uh, the wheel of your mouse to scroll back so you can see the entire sky type of thing. And so we, so in the west we have the sun setting. We have, um, like down here you can have different, a whole, Again, I could do a whole class on how to use this. It, it, there's a lot to it. Uh, but one of the things we want on here is, is the deep sky objects. So you click on this little saddle, uh, looks like a, a galaxy, and you've got all different types of deep sky objects out there. Now near Vega, here's, that, here's, here's Vega, Deneb, and Altair. There's that summer triangle we talked about. And right here, in Ve right nearby Vega, Lyra the Harp is what this is called. And you click right here and hit the space bar, and we center in on something called the Ring Nebula. Okay. Now the Ring Nebula is one of those planetary nebulas we talked about, That's where a star has kind of coughed its outer layers away toward the end of its life cycle and leaving a, a white dwarf star in the center there. So the Ring Nebula is a beautiful object we like to look at. You don't get the colors; it looks more greenish through the telescope, grayish green. When you take a picture of it, those colors kind of come out. Um, all right. So let's find Saturn and Jupiter. Let's see where they are. So one of the things you can do, it becomes like this circle when you go out too far. So you push on the ground and it makes it flat. Here's all the cardinal directions. So I'm going to get rid of the deep sky object stuff here. 
so we can see it better and let's see look toward the south where's where's my planets drew that i got the planet button on it um, yeah maybe i do they're not showing up they because they're going to be coming out of the east and they're yeah. oh it's too early it's, it's too, early. too early yeah okay just testing you okay it's too early here they come it's all right so yeah so you're looking at it so 10 o'clock Geez, I thought I saw them earlier last night. But, okay, so 10.30 or so, they should clear the trees. And one of the neat things you can do is you can actually click on the planet itself. So let's go to Jupiter, hit the space bar, and we can zoom in. And we can see the positions of the moons of Jupiter as well. We've got the great red spot right here. So this is a very useful program if you want to uh, find out when the red spot is going to transit across the side of Jupiter as well as knowing which uh, uh, moons are which around it. So, all right, so let's, let's fast forward to, um, to later in the month, to the 22nd. And we're interested, so July 22nd, because we're kind of interested in the comet, comet Neowise. And so what we're gonna do is find the Big Dipper. And so the Big Dipper is gonna be more always in the north. There it is. So, ah, the Big Dipper is actually part of something called Ursa Major. So again, uh, the Big Dipper is really what we call an asterism. It's part of the Great Bear. Uh, so the Dipper is only this part right here. And then you got the feet. Now the feet are gonna be important because that's where the comet's gonna be uh, during its peak period on July 22nd. So basically, um, can I see Auriga? I think Auriga's down here. Basically the comet's moving this way over each day. That, that line I showed you a few minutes ago, on the 22nd, it's gonna be right about here, somewhere approximately there. Um, again, so let's find out what time that spot is, is up in the sky. We're, that's one of the very useful things of this program is that you can go to any time you want. So, oh yeah, it's nice and high in the sky earlier in the evening. So, oh, you got, what, you got the atmosphere off? Yep. Oh, okay. All right, let's put the atmosphere back on. So yes, there's so many things you can do with this thing. There we go. Uh, let me turn off the, the characters. Um, boom, turn off the characters now. Okay, and we're gonna go down to, so 10 o'clock. Yeah, it should be fairly high in the sky. I mean, it's not, not too bad. Um, not super high, not super low, but so you should have a good, good hour. Let's see how much time, oh, you should be out for many, a couple hours. So look at this, one in the morning, it's still up in the sky. So this is definitely, the closer it gets to the dipper, it's getting closer to the North Star, which is up here, which means it's, you know, um, it's up longer. It's up, the North Star is up all night long. Uh, we had a comet in 1996 that went right by the North Star when it was in this position here. It was on, it was, it was up the entire night. So uh, it's kind of, uh, it's in a good spot. So... All right, let's find out what's happening in the morning um, as time goes on in the east. Let's see what time the planets are coming up. So I'm gonna bring it over to the east and let's go around. We'll end up the show here, kind of show you what sunrise looks like. And you got Mars coming up at midnight on the 23rd. And then Venus, which is in Taurus, the bull at three in the morning. And Mercury. So Mercury might be doable there toward the end of July. Didn't know that, right there in Gemini. And then you got the sun, okay? And so anyway, I really highly recommend this program, stellarium.org, right up here, stellarium.org, and just download it for free. So that's, that's pretty much it, okay. so. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know if we had any other questions that uh, we've been, uh, we put in the chat box that there was an, uh, a question as to where, uh, how do you get the Stellarium software? And um, so it's www.stellarium.org. Uh, and it's, again, it's right in the chat box. It's free. It's on, it works on PCs and Macs. It's, uh, it's a great, uh, uh, great program. Actually, uh, you know, to that effect, let me, uh, one thing I love doing is uh, I go back here to, 2017 and I go to August 21st 
Anybody remember what happened on that day? That's the sun came up and around. Now let's see here. Let's make it about 12:30, and we are going to zoom right in here on uh, on the sun. And you'll notice this little black dot right here. Anybody remember what that was? That was the moon. And you can see as time as we sort of scroll scroll uh, across. This is what this was the solar eclipse back in August of uh, 2017, and uh, it was a great uh, a great show for us here. It cut at about 2:30. Uh, uh, it got to about 70 percent uh, covered of the uh, of the sun. We had probably had at, uh, upwards of 1,500 people up here. It was uh, quite the uh, quite the event. So you could go to uh, you know, your birth date, find out what was up in the skies if that, if that interests you. Um, often people will call and, and say, hey, what is, um, what's that bright sky I see, you know, bright uh, light I see uh, early in the morning, you know, in the, in the east? And say, so, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's Venus. And actually there was a comment earlier, uh, so let's go to today. Give me a second here, we'll go to today right now. And um, somebody had asked, um, let's back up a little bit. Let's get out of the golf ball. Okay, so if we go back to, uh, say, uh, five in the morning, Venus is extraordinarily, uh, and one of the comments was that, you know, how, how bright Venus was. But look, it's, it's actually just, it's actually a crescent. Yeah. And a very small crescent, but yet it's extraordinarily bright. So um, it's... Uh, a neat thing to see in the sky, it really is. Uh, actually, one of the neat things that I tell people about uh, Venus is that uh, Venus at times has um, caused pilots to actually divert. There was a, a pilot that saw this light in the sky. They thought it was another plane coming at us. And so he, he went and diverted. Also, uh, I believe a, a locomotive engineer you know, looked down the tracks and saw a light right on the you know, right down the middle of the tracks. I thought it was another train, so he did an emergency stop, and eventually the Venus just sort of went on his way. So, uh, um, yeah, Venus is quite bright. So, uh, anyway, um, I don't know if there's any other questions, but um, so thanks so much for, uh, for coming. It was great to, um, uh, to have you join us. Uh, oh, well, yeah. So, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. And just want to mention, if you'd like to, to donate uh, via PayPal, it would be fantastic. And yeah, hof we hopefully we'll be open for the Perseids, if you want to talk about that. Right, right. So, uh, again, to the donations part, uh, down in the description, right um, right underneath there, there's actually a little uh, hot link that says Streamlabs slash Copernic.Observatory. And uh, that actually goes to a PayPal link, and you can donate that way. Uh, as far as the, uh, the Perseid meter shower goes, we are evaluating you know, how we might make that happen. Um, we might be doing a, uh, like a registering only. Also, the fact that it's over a couple of nights, you know, we may limit the number of people that we have up here. Uh, but So we're, we're still trying to figure out the logistics behind that. So uh, definitely check our website, and uh, we'll let you know what's going on. Oh, what's the that. next live stream? Oh, the next live stream actually will be next week. And um, it's... Um, Actually, something that my wife and I, actually my, my family and I do, uh, it's called geocaching. It's, uh, uh, I sort of tongue, tongue in cheekly call it uh, using multi-billion dollar satellites to uh, find Tupperware in the woods. It's actually a treasure hunt type of uh, activity that uh, you use with either GPSs or, or, you know, or smartphones that have uh, you know, a GPS app in it. And uh, it's actually quite interesting. You can learn, actually learn a lot about this country and this area uh, through geocaching. So my wife and I will um, uh, tell you about our exploits. And uh, you know, especially, uh, we're, I think we're all pretty much tired of being inside. This actually would be a great, uh, uh, a great kind of activity for, uh, you know, for families, but even you know, for adults. My wife and I love doing it, even when we don't have the kids around. So uh, that will be uh, uh, next week. And then the following week, um, we are planning on doing a, um, a preview of the Mars 2020 um, Perseverance uh, rover launch that is due to launch at the end of this month or there's a window between I think July 30th and uh, February 12th or 15th and so that's the window that they have to launch in otherwise they have to wait another 26 months for the, 
So we're, we're hoping that uh, they can, they can uh, get it launched between now and then. So anyway, it was great uh, seeing you all. Hello, Dodi. Uh, hello, Angelique. And um, uh, thank you all again for, for joining us tonight. Hope you uh, enjoy it. And please uh, tell your friends. Uh, we're currently at 299 subscribers. We need one more. Whoever's not subscribed out there, click that subscribe button. And uh, it doesn't cost you anything. And it actually uh, helps... Uh, helps us promote what we do and um, um, and we wish you we could have you up here tonight um, or and and you know and all the Friday nights but uh, until we can get through this uh, this uh, challenging time we're gonna uh, do our best to keep you engaged and um, and keep you safe so thanks again have a safe weekend yep. so long okay.